Right now on Morning News Now, playing defense. The White House and allies are blasting a special counsel report that questioned President Biden's age and mental fitness. Meanwhile, former President Trump is under fire for suggesting he'd encourage Russia to attack U.S. allies if they haven't paid their fair share to support NATO. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. We have reaction from Washington. Also this morning, a shooting at one of the most famous mega churches in the world. The gunfire broke out in between services at Joel Osteen's Lakewood Church in Houston. What investigators are now saying about the shooter and the five-year-old boy who was with her. Plus, Israeli forces say they rescued two hostages taken by Hamas who were being held in the city of Rafah. The news comes as Palestinian health officials say Israeli strikes have killed dozens of Palestinians in Rafah, including women and children. What we've learned about the rescue, the strikes, and the progress on a possible deal to free the remaining hostages. And a league of their own for the second year in a row and the third time in five years, the Kansas City Chiefs are your Super Bowl champions. We've got a look at last night's overtime thriller that was one for the record books. Good morning. If you are a little tired this morning, I am right there with you. I was, of course, up to watch that. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe is on assignment this morning. So you're with me. We're going to get started this morning at the White House, still on offense, following that bombshell report on President Biden's handling of classified materials by special counsel Robert Hur. This morning, the president's allies are defending the commander in chief after that special counsel questioned his memory, but stopped short of charging him for mishandling classified documents. His likely Republican rival, Donald Trump, has created a firestorm of his own, and it even has some members of his own party trying to distance themselves from him after remarks he made at a campaign event in South Carolina over the weekend. Trump appeared to suggest that the U.S. would not defend NATO countries that did not contribute enough to the alliance. Take a listen to what he said. Well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. NBC News White House correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now. Ali, good morning. So walk us through some of the weekend reaction we've seen to the special counsel's report on President Biden, what it said about his memory, and then tell us how it's impacting his campaign. Yeah, Savannah, well, we really saw a full court press launched by the Biden team and Democratic allies over the weekend coming to the president's defense in the aftermath of that special counsel report and those scathing details about his struggles with memories that the president denies. We saw several people trying to discredit the special counsel, saying that he's not a doctor and because of that doesn't have a right to be giving any <clears throat> sort of cognitive analysis. Uh, we also saw the White House press team put out uh, a memo, circulating a memo that quoted Republicans in the past complimenting the president's mental fitness. Uh, we uh, saw on Meet the Press yesterday, uh, DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, as well as Biden campaign co-chair Mitch Landrieu, come to the president's defense. Listen to that here. The most difficult part about a meeting with President Biden is preparing for it because he is sharp, intensely probing, and detail-oriented and focused. I'm telling you, this guy's tough, he's smart, he's on his game. And as Secretary Mallorca said a minute ago, when you go on to brief the president, you, gotta, you better have your big boy pants on. And, and this kind of sense that he's not ready for this job is just a bucket of BS that's so deep, your boots will get stuck in it. And Savannah, the Biden team knows that the age issue isn't something they can obviously wish away. So over the next nine months until Election Day, they plan to have a similar uh, instances that we saw on the Sunday shows yesterday with having a Biden allies come out and talk about their personal interactions with the president, trying to restore any lost confidence in his ability to serve a second term. Savannah. Ali, we're also seeing a mixed response by Republicans, of course, the former president's own party over those controversial comments that he made over the weekend about NATO and Russia. How are those remarks being received? Tell us what we're hearing from within the Republican Party and, and from the former president's allies. 
Yeah, those comments really ignited a firestorm of reaction over the weekend. Uh, we saw former Trump ally and former uh, 2024 presidential candidate Chris Christie come out and say that this is why for a long time uh, he has said that Trump is unfit to be president of the United States. Uh, Mr. Trump's lone GOP rival, Nikki Haley, slammed those comments, uh, saying that the last thing we ever want to do is side with Russia. But Republican Florida Senator Marco Rubio actually rushed to to the former president's defense, saying uh, that every president at some point in some way has complained about other countries in NATO not doing enough. And Trump is just the first one to express it in these terms. But these remarks uh, prompted notably a response uh, from the chief of NATO, uh, who said that the president, the former president's comments put European and American soldiers at an increased risk, Savannah. And Ali, while we have you, I do want to ask you about the health of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. So on Sunday, he was hospitalized again. So, of course, the last time this happened, Austin had failed to immediately notify the White House as well as the public. That was when he was being treated for prostate cancer and became quite the controversy for him. What do we know about his condition this time? Why is he hospitalized and how's he doing? Yeah, well, the Pentagon says that the defense secretary is back at Walter Reed Medical Center in the critical care unit this morning uh, because of a, quote, emergent bladder issue. Officials are confirming that his duties have been transferred to Deputy uh, Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks. The Pentagon saying that the White House and Congress were notified within hours of his, his admittance to the hospital. Uh, and of course, unlike, as you mentioned, his previous hospital stay. So this is obviously a very different approach here. Uh, and Austin's doctors say that these latest complications are not expected to impact what they anticipate to be a full recovery from his original uh, cancer diagnosis, his prostate cancer diagnosis. Uh, but they are not sure how long he will remain hospitalized. The Pentagon, though, vowing to continue updating the public as he remains there. Savannah. All right. Ali Rafa, thank you very much. Well, turning now to Houston, where a child is in critical condition after a shooting at the church of Pastor Joel Osteen. Officials say a woman entered Lakewood Church yesterday in between services with a long rifle and began shooting. The woman threatened that she had a bomb before two off-duty officers Open fire, killing her. The suspect was accompanied by a young child who is now critically injured after being shot. Police are still searching for a motive as to why the woman may have wanted to attack the church. Well, the father of one of five U.S. Marines who was killed in a helicopter crash in a remote part of Southern California last week is demanding answers about why the soldiers were flying during a significant weather event. NBC News' Priya Shreet there has more. He just always wanted to be a Marine, and he's very proud to be a Marine. Gregory Davis is struggling to come to terms with the loss of his son, 21-year-old Lance Corporal Donovan Davis. He is probably one of the most soft-spoken, kindest, gentlest people I've ever met. Lance Corporal Davis was one of five young Marines, all between the ages of 21 and 28, who lost their lives when the helicopter they were flying from Nevada to California crashed into a forest during one of Southern California's most intense rainstorms in years. It's been probably pretty much uh, the week every parent dreads having now Davis, who had a 25-year career as a Navy pilot himself, is demanding answers from the Department of Defense about why his son was flying that day. I've flown that route many times. I was just pretty much in shock that uh, after I'd heard the magnitude of the weather. Are you hoping that something could potentially come out of this investigation that might change the way the Marine Corps makes their decisions? Yeah, if they don't, then these five Marines died in vain. A spokesperson for the 3rd Marine Air Wing tells NBC News an investigation into the crash is ongoing. Military experts say leaders are always calculating risks when making decisions. In combat, these aviation units are uh, in bad weather. They're low level. They're at night. They're choosing to fly during those conditions and they're facing enemy action. So you simply have to get out this, this uh, you know, envelope and train to what you're going to face this time, Davis says the process failed, and now he's struggling to cope with the loss of his beloved son. He was a patriot. He was selfless. He loved flying. He loved doing, uh, being in the Marine Corps, and I guess he died doing what he really loved doing. Trying to make sense of his son's sacrifice. Priya Shreether, NBC News.
Well, a new storm system is threatening millions in the southeast with heavy rain, damaging winds and hail today. We've got Michelle Grossman here on set with the latest forecast. Hi, Michelle. Good morning. Hi there. Yeah, we are looking at all sorts of stuff with this storm. Another week, another storm. We're looking at that warm side that you just mentioned with severe weather threat. Also, the chance for really heavy rain, flash flooding. But on the cold side, we're looking at the chance of some snow. So a really warm weekend in the northeast and mid-Atlantic. Things are changing, though, over the next 24 hours. This is what radar looks like right now. So most of the rain is in the south. And we're going to see this all throughout the day. We're going to see the threat for severe storms all throughout the day here and really heavy rain. That's where you're seeing those brighter colors. That's where we're seeing those downpours. And that's why we're concerned about flash flooding, even seeing a little purple from uh, time to time. And that's indicating that we might be seeing some hail with some storms. So we do have flood alerts, 18 million people under flood watches. That's where you see the green. Also flash flood warnings. We're going to see these throughout the day. That means flooding is happening now or it's imminent because of all that heavy rain over very saturated grounds. Then as we move a little bit further to the north, we're going to see a transition to snow. We're going to first start out as rain in parts of the northeast New England. It's going to transition to snow, and it will bring some accumulating snow in spots. So we have 30 million people under winter alerts throughout portions of the Midwest, the Ohio Valley, into the northeast and also New England. It looks like the bullseye of really heavy snow will be parts of New England and then the interior parts of the northeast as well. 30 million people impacted. We have winter storm warnings as well. That's where you see the pink, and that's where we're going to see the heaviest amounts of snow. So let's talk about the severe side first. 10 million people at risk, especially where you see this yellow. So Albany, Savannah, Panama City, Mobile, under the gun for some strong storms. We could see some hail, a few tornadoes as well. Certainly we'll see some damaging winds and we will see some very heavy rain. We're already seeing that. Where you see this hatched area, that is the likeliest hood for some really strong storms. Lots of rain with it too. It's all through portions of the southeast into the mid-Atlantic, back through portions of the Tennessee Valley. Again, that bullseye for really heavy rain is where you see those darker colors. And then we're going to see locally up to four inches of rain with those really heavy downpours. Flash flood risk, we have a risk of flooding, a risk of flash flooding, especially where you see this blue. So places like Charlotte, Raleigh, Columbia, Augusta, Athens could see some really heavy rain and could see some flooding rains. So this is what it looks like. We have that area of low pressure that's going to move up to the north and east. It's sort of going to combine with the coastal low, and that's where we're going to see that cold air pulled in, and that, that's where we're going to see the threat for some snow. It moves out quickly tomorrow, but we will see a really tough commute for many in the northeast, also New England, and some really gusty uh, winds. Up to four inches of rain, as I mentioned, uh, as we go throughout today into tomorrow. And here is the snow. We're going to see locally up to a foot of snow in some spots. Some models are saying a little bit a little bit more, especially where you see that pink color. So Boston, Hartford, uh, looking at some really heavy snow. But also northwestern uh, New Jersey could see some really heavy snow and parts of Hudson Valley. So there's lots of spots that could see some really accumulating snow. Uh, New York City could see three to five inches. We're going to watch this closely because we could even up those totals as we go throughout the afternoon uh, hours with more models coming in. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I was seeing rain in my little app, but it might be snow. Rain. And then it's going to transition overnight and we're going to see some snow. We could see some bursts of snow at times and it's going to stick. So we are Great. thinking right now three to five inches. Oh, good. I'm so happy to hear oh, that. Good. I thought maybe we were done for the season. Nope. All right, Michelle, thanks so much. <laughs> sure. Well, now to Super Bowl 58, which took a little while to get going, but then ended with a bang. Kansas City Chiefs fans are celebrating big this morning after the team defeated the San Francisco 49ers in an overtime thriller that came down to the wire last night. The second half was a nail biter, a back and forth affair ending with the Chiefs taking home their second consecutive NFL championship. And that makes them the first team to repeat as champions in nearly 20 years. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung, who had moved to Las Vegas essentially for us, she is there this morning. She has more. Kaylee, good morning. So, I mean, this is really showing, of course, right, why this is maybe the beginning of a dynasty here. Back-to-back -back Super Bowl champions, first time since the Patriots. Just walk us through some of the major moments from this overtime victory last night. Yeah, and Savannah, not just back to back, but three in five years. That's pretty incredible. So this one, like you said, it started off slow. It was really a defensive battle in the first half. The 49ers got out to an early lead, a field goal, and then it took a trick play that ended with Christian McCaffrey fresh off being named uh, the offensive MVP of the league in the end zone. And then, and then the Chiefs caught fire, as you know they will. You let those guys stick around long enough, this is bound to happen. Mahomes started ginning up some magic. They'd been down 10, and then before you know it, we're tied in the final minutes of the game, going to overtime. What more can a football fan ask for? We got bonus football in the Super Bowl, Savannah. That is only the second time it's happened in the history of the game. You know, the 49ers, under these new playoff rules, they elected to take the ball first, could only get a field goal. 
And then it was as if that storybook ending was predetermined right in front of us. McCole Hardman ending up in the end zone then that time for the Chiefs. And that guy, he still can't wipe the smile off his face. He was just on the Today Show. He hasn't slept. He says he blacked out when he caught that ball in the end zone, not even fully recognizing the magnitude of the moment until Mahomes got up in his face and made sure he knew he just won the Super Bowl for him. But listen to more here from Patrick Mahomes. I can't even explain what, what was going through my mind. I was just extreme joy. Um, didn't even know where to go. Um, but, it, I mean, just it's so excitement, man. I'm so proud of the team, so proud of the guys. And to battle to the very end, I mean, that's, that was a microcosm of our season. I said it. Um, and everybody came together and we were able to get the win. Savannah, I've, I've, I'm, at a, I'm at a loss for words at this point. Like I said, <laughs> bonus football in the Super Bowl. How cool is that? It was a gift. It truly was. Oh, my gosh, it really was. And we're actually going to have McCall joining us soon, shortly, just uh, 20 minutes or so over here on our show. We're so excited to talk to him. Um, Kaylee, so let's talk about just what it was like inside the stadium, what fans thought. So we have Mahomes named MVP. Chiefs now had coached three Super Bowl wins. How excited were fans? Oh my gosh, it, it was absolutely electric. I mean, Savannah, we've been talking all week about how the energy was building in Las Vegas, and it was everything that we expected and more inside Allegiant Stadium. There were stars all over the place, uh, from Lady Gaga to Jimmy Kimmel, Jay-Z, Beyonce, LeBron. Uh, it, it was incredible. And then the fans, my goodness, the 49ers faithful heartbreak, absolute devastation and heartbreak for them by the end of this game, but they turned out in droves but you could hear those Chiefs cheers throughout the night in a way that they are fully recognizing the magnitude of the moment and the greatness that they're experiencing. I gotta ask you about what you were just talking about, some of the star power. So obviously Taylor Swift winning in her rookie year, as I like to keep saying. And then we had the Usher halftime show, brought these surprise guests out. He was on rollerblades, which was very impressive to me. Tell us what else happened. Okay, so the roller skates, I have seen his Las Vegas residency show, and that is an act that he started there. It's pretty incredible. Uh, no one fell off the stage from as far as I could see, but I was holding my breath, Savannah. <laughs> it was an incredible show. I mean, you and I, we grew up with Usher, right? His three decades long career, this halftime show was somehow able to span. He had all of the hits. Alicia Keys seemingly came out of nowhere on the piano. What a beautiful duet that was. And then, of course, as we expected, Lil John, Ludacris, Jermaine Dupri. Some disappointment there was no Justin Bieber, but mm. I think that would be the only note anyone has on the halftime show. It was everything we hoped it would be. A big shout out to the city of Atlanta, his hometown, who Usher really wanted to represent. And uh, yeah, no, no notes yeah. on that one. <laughs> exactly. Um, also, so Beyonce made this announcement at the big game, kind of part of a commercial she was in. And then everybody's like, wait, this is a real thing. Well, tell us about that. Yeah, so she released two songs from her very highly anticipated album and this follow-up to Renaissance during a Super Bowl commercial and with some help from social media. You know, this all happening while she's right there hanging out at the game with Jay-Z. So uh, that stole, I think, a little bit of, of Usher's thunder, perhaps, especially <laughs> on social media. But, you know, the queen will be the queen. Let her go. It's the night of the Super Bowl. All the, all the stars come out and all the big headlines get made. So add it to the list. There you go. And, of course, we saw the post-game celebration with Taylor joining Travis on the field yet again. Things we love to see. Kaylee Hartung, thank you so much. I hope you get some rest. I hope you get to sleep in your own bed soon. We appreciate you all week. <laughs> Thanks, Savannah. <laughs> Coming up, after more than 120 days in captivity, Israeli forces say they've rescued two hostages. What we know about the mission that brought them home and the progress on a deal to free the remaining hostages. Stay with us. Welcome back. Overnight, Israeli Defense Forces say they rescued two hostages that were abducted during the October 7th attack. According to a statement from the IDF, 60-year-old Fernando Marmon and 70-year-old Louis Har were found during an overnight rescue operation in Rafa. The rescue comes as Israeli military forces continue their mission into Rafa. Over one million Gazans are living in that city as a result of evacuations from the north. There's now growing international calls for Prime Minister Netanyahu 
to stop attacks on Gaza in order to protect civilian lives. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter joins us now from Jerusalem with the details here. Molly, good morning. So sounds like a pretty major breakthrough here for the IDF being able to rescue two hostages. Tell us what we're learning about them and the efforts to free them. Have we heard anything from their families? Savannah, that's right. One of the few successful rescue stories we have heard from the military, and they are releasing details about that daring operation. So what we know at 1.49 a.m. overnight, Israeli troops broke into a building in Rafah. And Savannah, as you described, Rafah is the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip. As you say, 1.4 million Palestinians uh, have been told to go there for the safety uh, of the civilian population by Israel. So really crowded area. And a minute later, Israeli airstrikes provided cover for those troops. Now, Gazan health officials, Savannah said, amid that rescue and amid that heavy wave of airstrikes, dozens of Palestinians died. Now, what we know about the two Israeli hostages, both older men were flown by a helicopter to a hospital in Tel Aviv where they are in good condition, according to the military. They have reunited with their families, Savannah. And we do actually have a very short comment from the niece of one of them. Let's play that and I'll talk to you on the back end. It was uh, very emotional to see them, to hug them, to feel them. Uh, it feels almost unreal. All the families won't stop till all the 134 hostages will be free. We will fight for the, their freedom. We will do everything we can so this of, of this uh, war crime will end. Savannah, very, very good news. And you can see and you can hear the relief uh, in her voice. That was the niece, excuse me, of Fernando Marmon, one of the two hostages uh, rescued overnight by the Israeli military. Mm, absolutely. Uh, Molly, meanwhile, a, a senior official tells NBC News that major progress on a deal to free the remaining hostages in Gaza could come as early as this week. This comes after a call yesterday between President Biden and Prime Minister Netanyahu. Where do things stand on this potential deal? That's right. So that it may be nearing kind of that closing deal stage, but gaps remain. We do not know how big or how significant those gaps are. But interestingly, Savannah, we have some new reporting from our colleagues in Washington, D.C., about kind of the growing frustration in the U.S. administration that they have not been able to get Prime Minister Netanyahu to agree to a ceasefire. And the new reporting says that Biden has really sharply criticized Netanyahu in private. Three people in at least three different instances tell NBC News that Biden has actually called the Israeli Prime Minister a quote a hole and that Netanyahu wants the war to keep going in order to stay in power. We are watching the, the flurry of diplomatic activity. We know the CIA director is heading to Cairo. So we'll be keeping a very close eye to see if those deal negotiations are actually indeed closing in. Savannah. Molly, this is of course going on, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, as there is this operation underway in Rafah. Netanyahu has called for an evacuation from the city and Israeli forces continue to advance. What is the humanitarian situation at this point for civilians? there, of course, where so many people had evacuated to. And what are we hearing from the White House on this particular point? That's right, Savannah. And we've already talked a little bit about this is a very small area in the southern Gazan Strip, rammed up right against the Egyptian border. Quite frankly, international organizations, UNRWA, UN organizations, and other humanitarian organizations are being very clear that there is no other place for people to evacuate. This is where 1.4 million Palestinian civilians already came down because they were told that it would be safe. Now, the White House, in their readout of the call from President Biden uh, to Prime Minister Netanyahu last night, did say, and this is from the White House, readout. It said the president also called for urgent and specific steps to increase uh, and put consistency, excuse me, humanitarian assistance to innocent Palestinian civilians. And he reaffirmed his view that a military operation in Rafah should not proceed without a credible and executable plan for ensuring the safety of and support for the more than one million people sheltering there. Uh, at least certainly what the U.S. has not seen given that statement and certainly what has not been made public to us here uh, in the country is any kind of executable plan to keep those 1.4 million civilians safe. Savannah. All right, Molly Hunter, stay safe. Thank you very much. Well, just hours before the Super Bowl on Sunday, senators were in session on Capitol Hill to push forward a $95 billion foreign aid bill. The package that includes funds to Israel, Ukraine and Taiwan overcame its latest procedural hurdle and the most positive sign yet that a foreign aid bill will have the support needed to pass the chamber. Joining me now is NBC News congressional correspondent Julie Sirkin. Julie, good morning. So this passed with 67 votes yesterday. What did we see in negotiations during a busy weekend for the Senate? 
Yeah, good morning, Samantha. It passed with 18 Republicans joining almost all Democrats as a sign that this bill has some positive chances to pass at the back end, but it's going to take some time to get there because of those negotiations that you mentioned that happened over the weekend. There's a lot of disagreement, especially among Republicans, towards sending that aid you see on your screen uh, to Ukraine. That's really, really important, of course, for Democrats uh, and, of course, for Republican leadership. But Leader Schumer was on the floor uh, making note of how rare this Sunday Super Bowl session was, the first time this has ever happened in Senate history. Here's what he said. I can't remember the last time the Senate was in session on Super Bowl Sunday, but as I've said all week long, we're going to keep working on this bill until the job is done. The only right answer to this threat is for the Senate to face it down unflinchingly by passing this bill as soon as we can. So here's the thing, it might take some time for them to actually pass this bill because you need a time agreement from all 100 senators to do anything quickly in the upper chamber. Without that agreement, this could drag on until Wednesday. That's when the final passage of this legislation could be, but it could happen as soon as tonight. You really don't know, time will tell. And Julie, we know conservative Republicans are hesitant to send more aid to Ukraine while the border situation and fixes to immigration remain unresolved. What are the remaining obstacles that the bill could face going forward? That's one of the reasons this is taking a long time, because they're trying to see if they can offer any amendments to adjust this bill, to put some of those border security provisions in there, especially to appease House Republicans who have drawn a red line essentially several months ago, saying they will not accept any aid to Ukraine uh, without those border security solutions. Obviously, as you and our viewers remember, Republicans did reject a bipartisan compromise last week. So it sounds like aid to Ukraine and Israel and Taiwan will move separately. Here's what Leader McConnell, the top Republican in the Senate had to say. Our partners don't have the luxury of pretending that the world's most dangerous aggressors are someone else's problem. And neither do we. So today, it's no exaggeration to say that the eyes of the world are on the United States Senate. Pointed comments from McConnell, of course, directing those at those hardline conservatives that don't want to send aid overseas, and certainly a group of senators and House members on both sides of the aisle who are attending that key Munich security conference at the end of the week. Savannah, they don't want to go empty-handed. All right, Julie Serkin, thanks as always. Coming up less than 12 hours ago, he made the game-winning catch in the Super Bowl. Now, Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver McCall Hardman Jr. is joining us on Morning News Now to talk about the biggest catch of his life. But first, texting while judging the real-life courtroom drama caught on camera as a judge sent hundreds of questionable texts while presiding over a murder trial. What she is saying now. Stay with us. Welcome back. In Oklahoma, a district judge has stepped down just a year after being elected. Why? Well, she admitted to sending hundreds of texts from the bench during a murder trial. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky has the details. It's the video evidence from a courtroom camera. Authorities say captures former judge Tracy Soderstrom on her phone mid-murder trial texting and scrolling social media. There were some things that I did inappropriately. That admission coming Thursday after Soderstrom announced her resignation following an investigation accusing her of gross neglect of duty and partiality in office. A judicial conduct complaint against Soderstrom states over the course of a murder trial involving the death of a two-year-old, the newly elected judge texted her bailiff more than 500 times, mocking the physical appearance of attorneys, jurors, and witnesses. I texted during a trial and that was inappropriate. The content I am not agreeing to um, because it doesn't matter. But the complaint cites messages that allegedly show Soderstrom was no longer impartial. At one point, Soderstrom calling a prosecutor gross and a horrible speaker while praising the defense attorney, texting her bailiff, can I clap for her? And during testimony, texting the state just couldn't accept that a mom could kill her kid. So they went after the next person available, adding, can I please scream liar, liar? Evidence Soderstrom still denies played a role during the trial. Um, I didn't make up my mind. Even if I had, it wouldn't have mattered because I was not the fact finder. 
Mid-trial comments went further. Soderstrom allegedly calling a testifying officer pretty, saying she could look at him all day. Authorities tell NBC News the bailiff is no longer a county employee. Meanwhile, Soderstrom has agreed to never seek any state judicial position ever again. Morgan Chesky, NBC News. Let's get you international headlines now. Thousands are taking to the streets in Pakistan to pr protest election results. Claudia Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudia, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Well, that's right. Supporters of the uh, now jailed former Prime Minister of Pakistan, Imran Khan, have blocked key highways to protest against alleged rigging of last week's parliamentary elections. Now, Khan could not run in the election, but candidates backed by him won more seats than the political parties who ousted him from power nearly two years ago. A government spokesman urged protesters to show grace by accepting defeat and asked them to move away from the highways. Now to Finland, where former Prime Minister Alexander Stubb will become the next president after winning an election ran off against ex-former Prime Minister Pekka Havisto. Stubb, of the National Coalition Party, declared victory Sunday night. Havisto congratulated Stubb and shook his hand as they watched the results come in. Stubb will become the 13th president of Finland since the country's independence from the Russian Empire in 1917. And we end up in Britain, where for the first time since his cancer diagnosis, King Charles III has made his first public comment. The King on Saturday expressed his gratitude in a statement thanking for all the messages of support he's received in recent days. Now, Charles and his wife Camilla were seen attending church in the east of England on Saturday, his first public outing since the diagnosis. Buckingham Palace has not given any details of his condition other to say that it is not prostate cancer. Back to you, Swan. All right, Claudio Lavanga, thank you so much. Well, coming up, it's the pop culture phenomenon inside the Super Bowl, from movie trailers to album announcements. We're taking a look at who made the grade and who missed the mark in this year's Super Bowl commercials. But first, Super Bowl hero McCole Hardman joins us on Morning News Now to talk about what it was like to make the game-winning catch in the Super Bowl. That's up next. Stay with us. We are back now with an up-close look at the Kansas City Chiefs' third Super Bowl championship in five years. In a back-and-forth game that took every inch to decide a winner, it came down to a game-winning touchdown in overtime to secure back-to-back -back titles for the Chiefs. And I am thrilled now to welcome the now three-time Super Bowl champion, McCole Hardman, who made that game-winning catch to get his third ring in overtime. McCole, thank you so much for joining us this morning. First, uh, congratulations, of course, Super Bowl champ yet again. How you doing this morning? Have you had a fun night? Some amazing videos of y'all's after party are coming out. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate you. Thank you. And yeah, definitely a uh, great night. The other party was was lit. Had some people come perform, so definitely enjoyed that. Oh, uh, yeah, it looked like a blast. Okay, I want to hear everything about how this goes down. So when there's six seconds left in overtime, Chiefs are losing, you're in the huddle. Tell us about that moment. I mean, what was the play call? Did you know you were going to get the ball? Walk me through it all. Yeah, so they uh, they called the personnel in, and I, I, it was crazy. I didn't even know they called the personnel. And I see Coach Reed just looking me dead in my eye, like, "You gonna go out there?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna go out there." And um, but the, the play was called Tom and Jerry, and um, it's like a like a two way play, either go to me or the running back, and um, so it's like a fake fake jet, and then just come back out, kind of like similar to the play we did um, last year Super Bowl in Philly, the one we scored off twice. Mm -hmm. And um, so did the fake jet, came back out. I seen the corner bell. I'm like, well, this is going <laughs> to this is gonna be my ball right here. And I caught the ball, blacked out for like three seconds and <laughs> started celebrating. So. so when you say you blacked out, you realize you crossed in, into the end zone? Did you just not realize you won the game? Tell me about exactly what that blackout meant. And then when Patrick was like, hello. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I remember everything. Like, I knew that we won the game. I knew um, that it was a walk-off. But when I caught it, I guess just the, the, I don't know, just all the emotions and the magnitude of the moment just, just got to me, I guess. And 
then finally I just see Pat run to me like, you know you're a champion, right? <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, and started celebrating from there. <laughs> At halftime, um, it was it was a different situation, right? Uh, a tough first half for y'all. I know that you just told our friends over at the Today Show that Travis was really the one that got you all focused in, in the locker room at halftime. Tell us a little bit about what he said and what the vibe was like at halftime. Yeah, you know, Travis, he's been very passionate, you know, the last uh, couple of days and um, just a lot of energy from him and definitely coming to the halftime. Um, I can't say exactly what he said, but definitely he, he said some things that, that make you, you know, refocus up and and get that fire going and definitely want to go out there and run through a brick wall for, <laughs> for what he said. So, you know, you got to be thankful for guys like that and the guys that are that passionate about the game and, and want to win so bad. And, and guys like that you want to you wanna play for and you want to do your best for. So everything he said got, it, got everybody right and, you know, came out with the win. I know Travis, after the game, also said that you're one of his favorite teammates. What's your relationship like with all the guys? I got a great relationship with everybody. You know, I'm a, I'm a guy to get along with everybody. Um, I try to, you know, talk to everybody and, and have a relationship, a, a bond with them. But, you know, me and Trav, we've we, we been at it since 2019, my rookie year. He kind of was the guy that, you know, took me under his wing and kind of taught me the game. And, and I just learned from him. And, you know, it's, it's crazy that you can watch a tight end, but he moved like a receiver and how smooth he really is. You know, he really can elevate your game and he's just a tremendous leader. So guys like that lead by example and um, definitely a guy that you'll follow, especially in this league. He's been doing it for a long time. Probably the best tight end to ever do it. So um, to learn from him, to, to grow with him and, you know, be a teammate this long is, is, is definitely special. Absolutely. McCall, before I let you go, last question for you. You know, you started the season on a different team with the Jets. You end it making the game-winning catch in a Super Bowl. Can you sum up kind of what this season's been like? Yeah, definitely up and down. You know, like you said, definitely signed with the Jets, you know. Definitely had a different vision going into that, and then when that didn't go that way, and just grateful that Kansas City uh, was traded back for me to bring me back home to the team that drafted me, and you know that was some up and downs as well with, with KC, especially you know the last couple you know playoff games. But you know now this game, you know walk it off. I think everything happened like it's supposed to, so mm. I'm definitely grateful for it. They brought you home, and you brought it home for them. McCole Hardman, thank you so much. Congratulations. I know it's probably been a long night, so we really appreciate you staying up and talking to us uh, last night slash this morning for you, and congratulations. Amazing to watch. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Awesome, thanks. Well, if you stayed up way too late watching that game, you also would have seen some of those great commercials. Well, from Beyonce trying to break the internet to Mr. T schooling us on his sketchers, they did not disappoint. Let's bring in Sally Hogshead, a brand expert and author of several books, including Fascinate How to Make Your Brand Impossible to Resist. Sally, good morning. So each 30-second spot costs $7 million, right? So tell us who made the most of their money last night. Yeah, think about that, $200,000 per second. Well, I wow. loved Dunkin' Donuts, and if I understand correctly, I think you did too. It yes. was oh. hilarious. You know, that's that's the kind of commercial that passes the drunk bar test, where nobody's listening, everybody's watching, they're talking about it later. Um, it, in the Super Bowl, it's a totally different type of advertising real estate. Stand out or don't bother, and that spot stood out. It really did. There was just so many people, Tom Brady in it, J-Lo saying, you can stay, Tom. And it's just funny because I think also what I loved about it is it felt organic since we see Ben with Duncan all the time. It's like, yeah, okay, he really yeah. loves this <laughs> to the point where he's going to do their Super Bowl ad. Um, there are a few looks at some upcoming films, you know, just kind of snippets of some of these trailers. What movies are people going to be talking about? You know, the uh, advertising a movie on the Super Bowl is a little bit different than a traditional brand because getting people talking about it online in social media, when you went online and you looked at what people were discussing, it really, uh, I think the the um, the spots that were about movies were not nearly as impressive. Mm. Finally, aliens, interestingly enough, made an appearance in quite <laughs> a few of these ads, really evident in the Squarespace ad that was actually directed by Martin Scorsese. What was yeah, the main yeah, takeaway there? One. Yeah, what was the main takeaway there? And how did it reflect the importance of kind of like messaging in these commercials? 
That spot had a great story, great premise. It was fun to watch, beautifully directed, of course, by Scorsese. But what, what really made it awesome was not just the way it was produced. It was the fact that it was different. In the Super Bowl, different is better than better. So that's a spot that we're mm. going to be seeing over and over again. All right, there you go. Sally Hogshead, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Savannah. Bye-bye. Let's stay on even more football headlines this morning. Amazon will reportedly stream its first ever playoff game next season. CNBC Silvana Hanau joins us with that in other news. Hey, Silvana, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. Yes, yeah, so Amazon has reportedly won the exclusive rights to stream one NFL playoff game next season on Prime Video. The Wall Street Journal says Amazon had been offered a playoff game this season, but passed. NBC Universal snagged the rights for Peacock in a deal valued at $110 million. That game drew 23 million viewers, making it the most streamed U.S. event ever. The journal says Amazon had a clause as part of its deal to stream Thursday Night Football, allowing it to claim next year's playoff game. A crowd in San Francisco vandalizing and setting fire to a Waymo self-driving car Saturday night. The witness who shot this video you're seeing told Reuters people were celebrating the Lunar New Year by setting off fireworks. Someone jumped onto the hood of the car and broke the windshield while others spray painted graffiti. Waymo says a firework was thrown inside the car, which wasn't transporting any riders. Police haven't said whether any arrests were made. And cocoa prices are at record highs as we head into Valentine's Day. Now, that's a headache for Hershey, which has warned about weaker profits this year. Cocoa futures have doubled over the past year, with bad weather in West Africa being blamed for damaging crops. Hershey CEO says given where prices are, the company will use every tool it has to manage the business, Savannah. All right, Silvana Hanau, thank you so much. You got it. Well, Valentine's Day is Wednesday and love is in the air. But before you start a new romance, you might want to think about finance, in particular the sorts of financial red flags that you should watch for in a potential partner. So the roses are the only things that are in the red. You feel me? <laughs> Joining us now with more on this is Emily Irwin, Managing Director of Advice and Planning for Wells Fargo. Emily, always great to have you with us. Thanks for being here. So they might not be a topic that you really want to broach, especially not on a first date, at least not directly. But when when is it a good time to introduce this topic? Good morning, Savannah. It's great to be here. Yeah, introducing the topic of finances into a relationship really can't come soon enough on some level. We know that people would rather talk about religion, politics, even death before they talk about money. And so getting comfortable about it early and often is important. First date material might be something like, the expectations of who's gonna pay, or what are you even doing on your first date? As you get further into the relationship, you wanna start thinking about things like, how are you gonna commingle your assets, if at all? Are you gonna have any joint purchases made together, even if it's something as benign as a vacation or as something as serious as signing a lease together? And so you wanna have conversations early, often and in safe places where there's low tension and you have the ability to really have a transparent conversation. Wow, even before death, people would rather talk about death than <laughs> money. Wow, that's really saying something. Um, our viewers may have just noticed this was already just up on our screen, but tell us some of the top financial red flags people should look out for. Absolutely. Well. Financial secrecy is a big one. You know, if someone's not sharing with you their spending habits, their saving habits, even their career goals, their debt on their balance sheet, that is a major red flag. And it's not just a red flag because it could get you into financial trouble as their partner. It's a red flag because it's a trigger for what else could they be hiding? How honest are they going to be about big things in their life? Um, prioritizing needs over wants, you know, it's great to be able to make that splurge. It's not not great to be able to make that splurge if it means you can't pay your rent that month. Um, ignoring debt is a big one. So debt does not mean it's necessarily bad. In many cases, you've invested in yourself, you're making a purchase, it might be a big one like a home. Um, however, revolving debt, the, the constant inability to not pay your bills on time, that's a big no-no. And then finally, unattractive frugality. This for me is the ultimate deal breaker. If you're not going to be open to, you know, tipping the wait staff, tipping the Uber Eats driver, you know, making that charitable gift around the holiday season or volunteering your time, mm. uh, you might want to steer clear from that. 
That's a really good point. It can kind of go both ways here, right? So if somebody does see any of these things you've just mentioned that are these red flags, they might, they don't have to be, I guess maybe I should say, deal breakers if I suppose you can maybe talk it out. I mean, how should somebody approach that? Yeah, the best way to approach it is to share your own money story. You know, what behaviors and what experiences either growing up or as an adult affected how you interact with money? How do you personally feel about kind of the big buckets in your life, the, the saving, the taking on debt? How do you tie your financial behaviors to your own goals? And then by sharing those, inviting your partner to do the same. That is a wonderful way to be able to start that conversation. And then really just paying attention to those micro behaviors. You know, if you see someone saying something, but they're constantly doing something else, you know, you have to have the strength to be able to say, hey, this doesn't really line up for me. What does this really mean for you? Is this making you uncomfortable? Because you want to be able to dig into that in order to be, have a healthy relationship. I am certainly not advocating in lieu of chocolates and flowers to bring your W-2 and your net worth statement <laughs> to your birthday, but you have to be willing to go there. There you go. Emily Irwin, as always, great advice. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks. Coming up, can they kick it? Yes, they can. From Ozzy Osbourne to Oasis, we're digging into this year's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees, and it's a list for the record books. That is up next. Welcome back. The Chiefs weren't the only team making home victory, taking home victory yesterday. The 2024 Puppy Bowl was positively adorable, with Team Ruff taking home the trophy and preventing Team Fluff from a three-peat win. As we mentioned on Friday, the program encourages animal adoption by bringing rescue pups from all over the country in a fur-tastic three-hour game. According to the Discovery Channel, the Puppy Bowl has a 100% sex rate, success rate meaning all the furry friends competing get adopted before it airs. This year's MVP, or most valuable pup, was not Patrick Mabones, <laughs> but a beautiful deaf Australian shepherd mix named Moosh. He scored two touchdowns, carrying the toys with no problem all the way to the end zones. We always love to see that. All right, well, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame just released its list of artists nominated for the 2024 class. The likes of Mariah Carey, Cher, Mary J. Blige, among the 15 nominees. Joining us down to break down the short list is, of course, entertainment journalist and pop culture expert Brian Balthazar. Brian, always great to have you with us. So tell us about some of the nominees we're seeing. Who are the big names? Good morning. Yeah, 15 nominees, 10 of them nominated for the first time. Let's take a look at some of the people, who, as you mentioned. Mary J. Blige, Mariah Carey, one of them for the first time. Cher for the first time. Dave Matthews Band, Eric uh, B. and Rakeem Foreigner, first time. Peter Frampton, James Jane's Addiction, Cool and the Gang, Lenny Kravitz, Oasis, Sinead O'Connor, Ozzy Osbourne, who actually was uh, um, inducted as a member of Black Sabbath previously, so this is his second time. Uh, Sade and a Tribe Called Quest. Now, keep in mind, only five to seven of these people or groups usually get inducted or actually into the Hall of Fame, and that takes a procedure here. There's about a 1,000 members, more than that, actually, uh, musicians, members of the music community, historians that weigh in on things like their contribution to the their influ influence, their impact, their contribution to the music world and community, and obviously their longevity. They have to have had their first commercial single released at least 25 years ago. So that establishes that they're longtime, you know, historic members of this community. But then the voters, they have to agree, 50% of them, each nominee has to get at least 50% of the vote to then get voted in. Yeah, so Brian, yeah, so tell us a little bit more. You just kind of broke down how this works. Um, what exactly does it mean at this point for some of these artists when they get nominated? So they had to have been, like you said, certain years, that kind of thing. Like, what is what are some of those qualifications? Right. Well, the 25 year rule, like that basically proves that they've had commercial success, that we still, you know, to be honest, we have to know who they are 25 years after their first commercial release. And those 1000 plus artists and historians are going to think about what is their legacy? Have they had commercial success? Have they had just fantastic music and how they impacted the greater music community as a whole? So, Brian, when will they actually announce the class of 2024? So we will find out in April, and then they will televise a big ceremony. It'll actually be streaming live on one of the streaming platforms in the fall. So, of course, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland is going to be the home of that. And it's always a big party, so it's going to be interesting that we'll be able to live stream it for the first time. Who are you most excited about, Brian? 
Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Well, you know what? I have to say, growing up, I was a foreigner kid. I know. I know. Don't, don't doubt me. But also let me throw in Cher. Interestingly, remember, Cher was actually kind of offended that she had not been nominated a long time ago and said she didn't even want it anymore. So it's interesting to see how those politics will play into whether or not she actually gets enough votes to be voted in. I'm looking and in, in, I'm curious to see how that ends up. Absolutely. All right. Brian Balthazar, I think we're also going to see you in our next hour. We'll be chatting again. Everybody, that's a little tease. Stick around for that. Appreciate it. As always, Brian, see you in a little bit. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News. Now stay with me, though. The news continues right now. Good Monday morning. Happy Monday after Super Bowl. I'm Savannah Sellers. Joe has the morning off right now on Morning News Now. Hail to the Chiefs after a thriller of a game in Sin City overnight. Kansas City is once again reveling in Super Bowl glory. And yes, of course, Taylor Swift was quick to rush down to the sidelines to congratulate boyfriend Travis Kelsey. We've got a full recap for you on this Monday morning. From Usher's slamming spectacle of a halftime performance to a huge surprise announcement from the queen herself, Beyonce. We are also following a shooting this morning at Joel Osteen's Lakewood Mega Church in Houston yesterday that ended with two people injured, including a child. What we know this morning about the suspected shooter who police say is now dead. In Washington this morning, the growing fallout from that bombshell special counsel report that put President Biden's mental fitness back into the national spotlight. How the White House is now working to assure Americans he is still right for the job. Plus, former President Trump taking heat this morning for comments he made on allowing Russia to potentially attack U.S. NATO allies. We will bring you the latest. And we are wrapping the hour up back in the world of sports with an NCAA superstar who's got her eye on a history-making feat that'll land her in America's record books. But we are going to get started this hour in Las Vegas where the Kansas City Chiefs are still in their Super Bowl era. The Chiefs celebrating their second consecutive NFL championship after pulling out an incredible overtime victory against the San Francisco 49ers. NBC News correspondent Kaylee Hartung was at the game last night, and she takes us through some of the night's biggest moments. Hey there. It's as if the Chiefs' entire season was encapsulated in this one game. It started off slow, but in the end delivered unbelievable drama. Only the second time in the history of the Super Bowl that we got overtime. Bonus football in the Super Bowl doesn't get any better than that. As the Chiefs stars Travis Kelsey and Patrick Mahomes prove why they are the NFL's next dynasty. The Kansas City Chiefs are champions again. Their overtime victory over the San Francisco 49ers, making them the first team to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls in almost 20 years. Viva! Viva! The Chiefs' hard-fought win over the Niners, a nail-biter to the very end. San Francisco's defense dominating, holding Kansas City down through the first half keeping them to just three points as tempers flared on the sideline. Comes over to Andy and goes, keep me in. But in the second half, some Mahomes magic tied it up, forcing just the second overtime in Super Bowl history. The final play punctuating a clutch drive. The moment catching wide receiver McCole Hardman completely by surprise, saying he actually blacked out during his game-winning catch. I threw a touchdown to this dude at the end of the game. And he looked at me, I said, and he had no idea. I said, dude, we just won the Super Bowl. And breaking the hearts of 49ers faithful, who came into Sunday as the favorites. Just know that the Kansas City Chiefs are never underdogs. Just know that. Chiefs Kingdom celebrating its fourth Lombardi trophy, including its most famous fan, Taylor Swift, who was seen hand in hand with Mama Kelsey and sealed the victory with a Super Bowl kiss with boyfriend Travis Kelsey. Swift arrived in Sin City just hours before kickoff, but the pop star was ready to party, throwing back a drink in the stands. The energy on the field only amped up at halftime. I'm so As Usher rolled onto the world's biggest stage, his career spanning spectacle bringing the heat. Featuring surprise guests, rap royalty Lil Jon and Ludacris, and a fan favorite slow jam with Alicia Keys. But they were far from the only stars shining in Vegas. LeBron James, Lady Gaga, Jay-Z and Beyonce all in attendance. The Queen Bee even had a few surprises of her own. Time for a surprise drop. 
appearing in a Verizon Super Bowl commercial and dropping two new songs from her highly anticipated album. Still, it was the Chiefs who were over the moon. You gotta fight for your right! This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that I've been able to to go through three times now, and man, it's, uh, it gets sweeter and sweeter every time, baby. Now with three Super Bowl wins in just five years, Kansas City's dynasty dreams are coming true. And let's put that dynasty into perspective. With Patrick Mahomes winning Super Bowl MVP, he joins Tom Brady and Joe Montana as the only players to ever win that award three times. And Patrick Mahomes is just 28 years old. He has accomplished more in his six seasons as a starter than so many of the greats of the game accomplished in their entire careers. And then there is coach Andy Reid winning his third Super Bowl. There are only two coaches who've won more than him. That's Bill Belichick and Chuck Knoll. We are watching greatness in real time. Back to you. All right, Kaylee, thank you so much. We've got entertainment journalist and pop culture expert Brian Balthazar back with us to break down all the major celebrity moments of the Super Bowl. Brian, good morning. Okay, so of course, let's start with the halftime performance by Usher. It was a millennial's dream concert, really, and I can't get over the rollerblades. So tell us, who were some of the stars who joined him on stage, and how did it really kind of like celebrate his whole career? Right, it was a jam-packed party, 13 minutes long, but it, it had everything really, including many of his great friends and collaborators over the years, including Alicia Keys, which was a great surprise to see, and this really cool piano with red flowing fabric. And Amazing. Sing, if I, I, and then we had Lil Jon, we had Ludacris, Her, Will I Am, Jermaine Dupri. Um, it was really, of course, the Rollerblades moment was incredible, marching bands. Uh, showgirls, uh, a guy flying through the air. It really had something for everyone. And of course, an amazing list of hits caught up. Love in the Club, Burn, You Got It Bad. It, it was a party. And of course, let's be honest, Usher has become expected uh, for or uh, known for taking his shirt off in concert. He did that too. <laughs> the fact that they have these lights in the crowd that change in tandem with the show. We've seen it before, but it never fails to dazzle us. But it was a really a great crowd pleaser. I thought everyone really loved it. And people that were there saying it was unlike any live performance they'd ever seen before. Wow, really cool. I liked how it was kind of like a little Vegas theme at the beginning, right? To kind of fit where he was. It was pretty cool. Yeah. Okay, now, of course, time to talk Beyonce. So she announced act two of her Renaissance era last night during her Verizon commercial. I got to say, I didn't fully get that that's what was going on at the time. And then it was like, oh, whoa, this was real. And it included two new tracks. Tell us about this rollout. Right. It's so interesting. You know, the new thing for artists, Taylor and Swift and Beyonce among them, is to leave hints and clues, Easter eggs about what's coming. We've seen Beyonce wearing a cowboy hat at a recent uh, award show. She give, does this commercial for Verizon and she's trying to break the internet. And there are all these shout outs to prior things that she's done and then winks to things like her running for Beyonce of the United States. Um, but then at the end, she still hadn't broken the internet. So she says, okay, let's drop the music. And at that moment, two singles were dropped on title. Later after the Super Bowl, uh, on all platforms, one of them called Texas Hold'em, the other called 16 Carriages. These are two tracks on her album that's coming out March 29th. That is a country adjacent or country uh, fusion album, which I think people are really excited about. Obviously, these two singles are already charting I iTunes. And what would Beyonce says something? Uh, people listen. So yeah. I'm excited to see yeah. what happens next. Isn't that true? It's always fun, too, when you see an artist switch genres when they are as talented as somebody like Beyonce is. Um, okay, let's talk about commercials uh, other than Beyonce's Verizon one. My favorite was J-Lo and Ben Affleck. And actually, it seems like a lot of people agreed that was sort of like they were winners on social media with this Dunkin' Donuts ad. By the way, a lot of other people in there, Matt Damon, Tom Brady. Tell us about this commercial. And Part of what I liked about it was kind of seeing a different side of their relationship, right? What'd you think? Right. I love it because it leans in on what started out as a meme. You know, yes. uh, Ben Affleck yes. carrying Dunkin' Donuts and paparazzi photos. Here we have J-Lo recording a single and Ben Affleck in his full Boston accent now decides he's going to start a music career and kind of crashes the recording session as the lead uh, singer of the Dung Kings. Obviously, it's a Dunkin' <laughs> Donuts commercial. And we have his friends that include, we have Matt Damon over to the side, sort of horrified. There's Tom Brady. Um, it's just the list goes that we have uh, the Dunk Jack Harlow, Fat Joe at the end. So... The song is terrible, obviously, but it's one of the, it combines the best of celebrity surprise, the virality of the Dunkin' Donuts meme with him, and and just humor. I think it's a great commercial, and it is the one that people are talking about this morning. Oh my gosh, I thought it was hilarious. I was laughing so hard when she tells Tom, Tom, you can stay after she tells Benton to leave. Pretty funny. <laughs> right. And we've talked 
about this, Ben. This is not going to happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we talked about this. Um, all right, now, of course, save my fave for last. Taylor Swift. I mean, you, I like how you're always like, it's funny when you ask me about Taylor Swift because I can <laughs> right. tell you everything. You so I am going to just make a few of my favorite points and then I'm going to hand it over to you, Brian, which was obviously this whole girl gang that she's got with her in the suite. So you could tell us about that. It was so fun. Then, of course, seeing her on the field. Then also now there's videos coming out from the after party where the DJs, the Chainsmokers are playing her songs. They're playing You Belong With Me. Travis is singing it to Taylor. I mean, it's just like, it's like a Taylor Swift song. Right. I mean, first of all, I feel like if you watch the whole game, Taylor Swift was all of us at the end. There was a shot of her biting yeah, her yeah. nails. <laughs> no matter what team you're on, this was a nail biter. There was another cutaway while she was, that she was chugging a beer, and I don't think she was aware of it. There you see Blake Lively. I think that's Ice Spice over there to the left. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, interestingly, she knows the camera's on her constantly, but also just as her authentic self. And, you know, people have talked about the Taylor Swift effect. Everyone was questioning what was going to happen in the last, literally the last 20 seconds of this game. And it was kind of fun to see that jubilance and excitement. And, of course, we see the photos of everything that happened on the field. You know, this is this is just an unusual time in, in this era, of this generation of this <laughs> romance that's happening. And it's kind of fun to watch it happen. I think it's hilarious that people get so fired up about it. It's just music and football. It's okay. No, you know, it's it's fun. Let's have some fun with it. And I love that they're having fun with it. Could not agree more. And obviously, Taylor Swift had to win in her rookie season. Know what I'm saying, Brian? <laughs> No losing. Great to see you as always. Thanks for covering it all for us this morning. See you soon, my friend. All right, now it's time to get a check on your morning news now weather. We have Michelle Grossman here in studio with us, and we've got a look ahead some snow, some rain, a lot going on. Hey, Michelle, good morning. Hi there, good morning. Yeah, a lot going on. We have the threat for severe weather, flooding rains today, some really gusty thunderstorms, and then on the cold side of a storm system, we are looking at some snow. So let's talk about today because that's the biggest story for today. That storm threat throughout the southeast, we could see really gusty winds, we could see hail a few tornadoes, uh, but certainly some heavy downpours leading to flooding, some flash flooding as well. This is going to move up the coast, so overnight into Tuesday, we're going to see some rain transitioning to snow in parts of the Northeast and also New England. Further to the west, we're quiet in the middle of the country, mild temperatures throughout the Northern Plains, uh, parts of the Central Plains, and then we have some, some snow falling in portions of the Intermountain West, but relatively quiet out west as well. By Wednesday, we see heavy snow throughout the Northern Plains, really heavy snow throughout the Intermountain West as well. Bright sunshine, nice temperatures in the south central states really nice throughout the uh, east coast as well in terms of any precipitation we are dry we're going to see temperatures returning back to normal it's another mild day today but a big drastic change as we go throughout tuesday into wednesday and then friday lots of snow throughout the middle of the country the northern part of the country into the west we have some uh, rain falling in the west as well by friday golf rain also on friday but this is what it looks like right now so radar we're looking at very heavy rainfall lots of bright colors that's showing us where this intense rainfall is falling and that's why we're concerned about flooding and also flash flooding. So we have that powerful storm that's bringing 18 million people with flood alerts. We have flash flood warnings. We also have uh, some winter weather alerts. So as we go throughout uh, the day, we're going to be watching this, especially into tonight into tomorrow. We're going to see that snow transitioning. So 30 million people, Savannah, looking at the chance of some snow. We'll end it with some snowfall totals just because I know we're always looking for numbers. So 30 million people involved in winter alerts. And we could see three to five inches in New York City and even further uh, to the north. We're looking at a foot of snow in some spots. I am excited about a little Good. bit more snow. Right? Like we're coming to the end oh, of winter same. one more time. Yes, we need at it. Least. Yes. At least. Yes. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. Sure. Well, this morning, there are new concerns over the health of Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. The Pentagon says he's back in the hospital, this time for a bladder issue. It comes as President Biden and his allies are on the offensive after last week's special counsel report called his memory into question. NBC News senior White House correspondent Gabe Gutierrez joins us now from Washington with all this. Hi, Gabe. Good morning. Hey there, Savannah. Good morning. It's not clear how long the defense secretary will remain hospitalized, but one notable change from last time, the Pentagon alerted the White House immediately. This morning, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in critical care, hospitalized at Walter Reed again yesterday, this time for symptoms of a bladder issue, according to the Pentagon. Overnight, doctors saying that Austin was then admitted to the critical care unit for supportive care and close monitoring. Last month, the defense secretary faced scrutiny for not telling the White House that he underwent surgery for prostate cancer until days later. We did not handle this right, and I did not handle this right. Now, the Pentagon announcing this stay publicly, saying he's transferring duties to his deputy. 
Concern for Austin coming as President Biden is on defense politically after that special counsel's report saying he faced memory issues. A new poll finds most Americans believe both President Biden and Republican frontrunner Donald Trump are too old for another term. And though he continued to attack Biden over the weekend, Trump himself is now under fire after a wild weekend rally where the former president encouraged Russia to attack U.S. allies if they don't pay their dues in NATO. I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. His opponent, Nikki Haley, quickly responding. What bothers me about this is don't take the side of a thug who kills his opponents. Haley also speaking out about Trump's personal attacks on her husband, Michael, at the same rally. What happened to her husband? Where is he? He's gone. Haley writing back, Michael is deployed serving our country, something you know nothing about. Donald Trump clearly doesn't understand that in South Carolina, we love our military men and women. Meanwhile, the White House is slamming former President Trump's comments on NATO saying that, quote, encouraging invasions of our closest allies by murderous regimes is appalling and unhinged. Savannah. All right, Gabe Gutierrez, thank you so much. Well, turning now to Gaza, where officials are working towards reaching a ceasefire in exchange for the release of hostages being held by Hamas. A senior official tells NBC News a breakthrough could come as early as this week. The negotiations come as Israeli forces set their sights on Rafah, where over one million Gazans are seeking refuge from the war. NBC News foreign correspondent Molly Hunter has the latest from Jerusalem and joins us now. Molly, good morning. So President Biden's actually sending CIA Director William Burns to Egypt tomorrow to continue negotiations to release the remaining hostages. Is there hope that a deal could be coming soon? Are we seeing signs of that? Yes, yeah, Savannah, we're certainly seeing signs. The drumbeat kind of leading up to the possible announcement of a deal seems to be growing louder. And certainly, if Bill Burns is deployed, that means that the administration clearly thinks that there's something uh, to be gained with actual senior diplomacy happening on the ground. As you mentioned, though, a senior administration official told NBC News it's pretty much there, but gaps remain. How significant exactly those gaps are, we're not sure. But the senior administration, administration official continued to our colleagues in D.C. saying this deal, unlike the November deal is more complex, that there are significant issues that still have to close. And really, as we know, the U.S. and Israel are looking to get all of those hostages out, not just kind of a first wave, not just the women who remain. Uh, and Hamas has been very, very clear, of course, Savannah, they don't want just a pause in fighting. They want a full ceasefire. Savannah. Molly, I know we're also learning new details about a call over the weekend between President Biden and Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu. The two discussed this looming hostage negotiation deal, but also the ongoing attacks near Rafah again, where several Palestinians had evacuated to, had been told to move to. What more can you tell us about what was discussed on this call? Yes, yeah, Savannah, and just to give you context, and we are hearing kind of growing criticism from the U.S. administration about Prime Minister Netanyahu's plan, or at least announced plans for a possible incursion into Rafah. Rafah is the southernmost city in the Gaza Strip, slammed up against the Egyptian border. And when we see pictures now, it is just a huge tent city. As you mentioned, 1.4 million Palestinian civilians have been told to go there by Israel. These are people who have evacuated from elsewhere in the Gaza Strip, and they were told that this area was the safe zone. Now, in the call last night, we did get a readout from the White House between uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and President Biden. And in that, they say the president has really reaffirmed that a military operation in Rafah should not proceed without a credible and executable plan for ensuring the safety of and support for more than one million Palestinians sheltering there. The plan or the possible plan for an incursion into Rafah has been heavily criticized, criticized excuse me, by international organizations who have been working there on the ground, Savannah. And I do just want to share a little bit more reporting from our team in Washington about the Netanyahu-Biden relationship. There is clearly growing frustration from the Biden administration that they have not been able to convince Netanyahu to accept or to agree to a ceasefire. Well, Biden has said that Netanyahu wants the war to drag on so he can remain in power. And then according to three people in at least three instances, Savannah, Biden has even called the Israeli prime minister a, quote, a-hole. Savannah. And Molly, we have a devastating update. Also, this is something that our, our viewers may remember. The six-year-old girl whose phone call to rescue services in Gaza City, it drew attention around the world. Uh, here it is on your screen, the little girl herself. What do we know about this? 
That's exactly right. This was a major story, of course, that we covered last week. Our network covered as well as many other international organizations over the weekend. Six-year-old Hind Rajab was fleeing from Gaza City with her family. Six people uh, kind of smashed into a small civilian car. And those audio recordings suggested that Hind, and she was calling the Palestinian Red Crescent, um, saying, come and get me, suggested that she was the only person still alive in that car. Well, Palestinian, the Palestinian Red Crescent has now been able to reach that area, Savannah. They have found not only the body of Hind and her relatives, their car completely smashed up, bullet ridden, but also just 50 meters away, this smashed up kind of wreckage of the Palestinian Red Crescent ambulance and the bodies of two paramedics, uh, everyone there dead. Savannah. All right, Molly Hunter, heartbreaking update there. Thank you so much. Well, let's turn now to Houston, where police are still searching for answers after a tragic shooting at a packed megachurch yesterday. Police say the female shooter who opened fire at Joel Osteen's well-known Lakewood Church is now dead. NBC News correspondent Morgan Chesky joins us from Houston with the latest. Morgan, good morning. Savannah, a simply terrifying ordeal here inside Houston's Lakewood Church, where Pastor Joel Osteen says they serve about 45,000 people each and every week. Now, this happened just minutes before the beginning of a Spanish service when witnesses say this woman walked inside and opened fire. And today, two off-duty officers are credited in fatally shooting her and taking her down after this shooting that's left a large church community shaken to its core. A Sunday service interrupted by a terrifying sound in a house of worship. Yeah, we're not. Gunfire blasting through Lakewood Church's Spanish service. The pastor pausing only to hear more shots ring out. The chaotic scene unfolding after police say an unidentified woman armed with a rifle and wearing a trench coat walked inside and opened fire. We're shooting at Lakewood. Two people down. We need ambulance. A young boy in critical condition. Another churchgoer? Shot in the leg. Two off-duty officers are credited with fatally shooting the suspect. Suspect is down. Police saying the wounded child arrived at the church with the female shooter. But won't speculate if officers who returned fire were the ones to strike that young victim. If it was, unfortunately, um, and, and, and that female, that suspect, put that baby in danger, I'm going to put that blame on her. Officers telling NBC News the woman was wearing a backpack and said she had a bomb. They also say she sprayed an unknown substance on the ground, but the bomb squad found no explosives. This is a light, uh, an isolated incident, we believe, at this moment, okay? Uh, no farther danger to uh, our public. This morning, the shooter's motive is still unclear, but is part of an ongoing investigation. For church member Mariah, who just moved from Colombia, the fear, hard to fathom. I thought that I maybe will die. After that, I just sent a message to my husband, say that I love him. Pastor Joel Osteen stressing, had it happened just minutes later, even more churchgoers could have been targets. We don't understand why these things happen, but we know God's in control. And this morning, we're still awaiting an update on the condition of that young boy who was wounded and last listed in critical condition. Also, the man wounded in the leg is in stable condition. Uh, investigators also providing some clarification about some of the early theories about this shooting, Savannah. There were originally rumors of two gunmen, but police say that is not true and that this woman acted alone. Savannah. All right, Morgan, thank you so much. Well, King Charles has made his first public appearance since his cancer diagnosis was revealed. The British monarch attended a church service yesterday alongside Queen Camilla. NBC News foreign correspondent Megan Fitzgerald joins us from London with the details. Hey, Megan, good morning. Savannah, good morning to you. That's right. We saw King Charles walking to church yesterday. He seemed to be in good form. He was waving and smiling to the crowd. A similar scene that we saw last Sunday, just hours before he announced to the world that he's battling cancer. This morning, a new look at King Charles after being diagnosed with cancer. The king smiling and waving to onlookers as he walked to church service Sunday in Sandrium. His wife, Queen Camilla, by his side. The outing coming a day after Charles's first public statement since the announcement that he's undergoing cancer treatment. The king expressing his gratitude for all the well wishes, saying... 
As all those who have been affected by cancer will know, such kind thoughts are the greatest comfort and encouragement. It is equally heartening to hear how sharing my own diagnosis has helped promote public understanding and shine a light on the work of all those organizations which support cancer patients and their families. The palace has not revealed details of Charles's illness, which was discovered after he was admitted to the hospital where he was treated for a benign enlarged prostate, only saying Charles does not have prostate cancer. Queen Camilla speaking out about her husband's status in her first public comments. He's doing extremely well under the circumstances and he's very touched by all the letters and messages. You know, all the, the public has been sent from everywhere. And it comes after Princess Kate, who was in the same hospital as the king, is still out of the public eye, recovering from abdominal surgery. Kensington Palace saying she's progressing well. Most British school kids are off this week. Traditionally, William and his family go to the Sandringham Estate, a favorite place for school breaks, though they've not been spotted there yet. Not only is there more for the children to do, there's a more active lifestyle, there's fewer prying eyes trying to see what they're up to, but I think it's a bigger house, it's somewhere where, where Kate can relax. It would be a welcome break for William, now taking on even more responsibilities as the king steps back. And over the weekend, Princess Anne, one of the few active senior royals seen at a rugby match. She's helping with royal representation, but it's the heir to the throne that's tasked with stepping up. Now, we are not expected to see King Charles in public for official duties. So far, he has been conducting uh, his weekly audiences with the prime minister, and he's been doing his private business. Savannah. All right, Megan, thank you so much. We've got much more to come on this hour of Morning News Now, including the drive that's gaining ground across America to make the day after the Super Bowl. That would be today a national holiday. Can't say I disagree with that. First, though, after the break, the special election here in New York to replace disgraced Republican Congressman George Santos. We've got more on the candidates vying for the job and what the future could hold on Capitol Hill if his seat flips blue once again. Those stories and more are next. Stay with us. We're back now with some international news. Hungary's first female president has announced her resignation. Claudia Lavanga joins us now from Rome with that and more. Hey, Claudia, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Well, that's right. The president of Hungary, Katalin Novak, announced on state television her resignation literally a week after a local news website announced that she pardoned a man who helped cover up sexual abuse in a children's home. Now, the news caused a public uproar, widespread protests and calls for her to step down. During her resignation speech, Novak apologized, saying she made a mistake and believed that the convict did not abuse the vulnerability of children he had overseen. Her resignation is also a rare blow to Prime Minister Viktor Orban, her close ally. Let's now go to Kenya, where the country's Truck Federation announced that the marathon world record holder Kelvin Kiptum was killed along with his coach in a car crash. The crash happened on a, roading, on a road in western Kenya, in the region that's renowned as a training base for distance runners. Kiptum set the world record in October in Chicago, becoming the first man to run the marathon in under two hours, one minute. He was due to compete at the Rotterdam Marathon in April, which will have been his first event since breaking the world record. And let's end this tour of the world in the north of Brazil, where carnival revelers brought the idea of recycling to a whole new level, dressing up in outfits made from hundreds of cans of beer and soda. This bubbling street party started in 1997, when a group of friends began gathering discarded cans left behind by carnival goers and attached them to their clothing. Since then, recycling in the area has improved, but locals thought they will continue the tradition to keep raising awareness and just because, of course, it's fun. <laughs> All right, Claudia, thank you so much. Well, voters in New York's third district on Long Island will head to the polls on Tuesday in a high-stakes special election to replace disgraced... <clears throat> 
excuse me, former Representative George Santos. The extremely controversial Republican was expelled from Congress back in early December after a 23-count federal indictment alleged a number of crimes. And with a razor-thin House majority hanging in the balance, Nassau County Republican legislator Mazi Pillip will go head-to-head -head against the former Democratic Representative Tom Swazi. NBC News senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor joins us now from New York's 3rd District to let us know what we should watch out for. Hi, Sahil. So what can you tell us about the two candidates on the ballot to replace George Santos? Good morning, Savannah, from Great Neck on Long Island. There's one day to go in this highly consequential special election. Early voting is done. Voters will head to the polls tomorrow to decide between two candidates. The candidates are Mazi Pillup, a Republican. Uh, she is a Nassau County legislator. She has an, uh, a fascinating life story. She's an Ethiopian immigrant to Israel. She served in the Israeli military before immigrating to the United States. Tom Swazi is the Democratic candidate. He's a former congressman representing this exact district before it elected George Santos a couple of years ago. He's also the former mayor of Glen Cove and a county executive with some deep roots in this area. Look at that poll on the screen. This is a close race. That's a margin of error survey. Tom Swazi leads by four points. He is seen by both Democrats and Republicans as having a slight edge in this election, but neither party is taking it for granted. Democrats I've talked to are nervously optimistic that he can pull this out, and Republicans I've talked to are simply nervous. They're bracing for any outcome. They recognize that Tom Swazi has got the name recognition here. In terms of issues, Let's show what the recent Siena College poll that we just showed uh, says the major issues are in this race. There is the issue of uh, addressing the migrant influx. Mazi Pillup has an advantage there. That's the single biggest issue that Republicans are trying to ride to victory. There's a lot of discontent in this area about that. On the issues of abortion, uh, Tom Swazi has a 23-point lead on protecting democracy. Swazi has a 9-point lead on making Congress work. Swazi has a 10-point lead. You can kind of see a pattern there. Uh, he leads on most of those other issues. Savannah. So, Sahil, Republicans hold this razor-thin majority, right? I mean, you need to look no further than the recent failed vote to impeach Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas. How significant could the way this goes be for Congress and the balance of power? Yeah, very significant, Savannah. This has been a wafer-thin majority for House Republicans. They have repeatedly struggled to govern. They currently have 219 seats to Democrats' 212 seats based on medical absences. It's been a two-vote margin. And we saw just last week when what would have been a historic vote to impeach Alejandro Mayorkas, the DHS secretary, ended up being a historic and spectacular failure for Republicans when they lost just three votes. It was a 215 to 215 tie is how that ultimately turned out before one flipped. If Republicans had this seat on Long Island, they would have succeeded on that vote. That's how close the margin is. So when you look at issues like funding the government, reauthorizing the FAA, this election will either put further pressure on that Republican majority, force them to maybe compromise with Democrats, or give them that tiny one vote cushion mm. that in some cases, as we saw last week, could be the, the difference between success and failure. Sahil, since this district has shown it can swing pretty easily from party to party, does this special election tell us anything about what we can expect in the general election? It absolutely does, Savannah. This has been a quintessential swing district. Uh, let's show some of the numbers. In 2020, this district voted for President Biden over Donald Trump by eight points. Two years later, it flipped dramatically, a 16-point swing, George Santos, that now expelled Republican, won this uh, district by eight points as well. This is precisely the type of district outside New York City that Democrats need to win if they want to take back the House. There are a number of them like this, which is why this district will give us a, some tantalizing clues as to what the national environment is going into the fall election when the entire House of Representatives is up for grabs, when, of course, the presidency is up for grabs. Districts like these, swing districts with a lot of red, with a lot of blue in them, will determine which party controls Congress and the White House uh, in, uh, it, later this fall. Savannah? Sahil, real quick, we just have a couple seconds, but I'm just wondering, I mean, because of kind of the, the blaze that this all went down in with George Santos, is there any anger there among voters about the fact that it doesn't really seem like the Republican Party had, had vetted him very well? I would say there's more embarrassment than anger. I think Republicans have tried pretty hard to wash the stench of George Santos off their party brand. They want nothing to do with him, especially after uh, his long litany of fabrications in his biography and that 23-count federal indictment on a smorgasbord of alleged crimes uh, came out. It's Republicans in this area, Savannah, who are the clincher in forcing him out, forcing Congress to expel him.
All right, Sahil Kapoor, thank you so much. Good to see you. Well, coming up, celebrating a civil rights icon on one of Hollywood's biggest stages. After the break, the Oscar nominee who's captivating on-screen performance in Rustin is bringing 1963's March on Washington back to the spotlight in 2024. That is up next on Morning News Now. Welcome back. Oscar nominee Coleman Domingo is up for Best Actor for his powerful performance as Bayard Rustin in the biopic Rustin. As an organizer of the March on Washington, Rustin was little known, but a key leader in the civil rights movement. NBC News Now anchor Zinclair Esamo spoke with Coleman about Rustin's legacy. Counting on the courts to eradicate racial inequity, that's madness. Coleman Domingo's performance in Rustin is captivating audiences. I'm the one that's been preaching passive resistance. Domingo brings to life the story of unsung civil rights hero Bayard Rustin. The actor, celebrated for his roles in Euphoria. You think you're tough? I'm tougher. And The Color Purple. Don't you move a muscle. Now Oscar nominated for Best Actor in the biopic. There were many years where people said if there was a Bayard Rustin biopic, you should play him. Yeah, it's, I feel like that there has always been sort of a secret society of people who knew about Bayard Rustin. When this opportunity came at 51 years old, when Bayard was 51 years old, when he organized the March in Washington, that I had a, a lot of what I needed to do this film. In terms of life experience? Life experience, leadership skills. I knew I had, I've stored up a lot that I needed. Rustin was a critical force behind the 1963 March on Washington, where around 250,000 people gathered. The organizer seen here behind Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Anything you learn about him surprise you, Rustin? There's so much that surprised me about him. I, I was surprised at his um, candor and his wit and how he used language as his weapon. The first demand is that we have effective civil rights legislation. Raised by his grandparents, Rustin studied the nonviolent principles of Gandhi and is credited with introducing nonviolence to King, later becoming one of his closest advisors. Rustin working alongside the likes of A. Philip Randolph, Ella Baker, and John Lewis. There can be a desire to present this kumbaya sentiment mm -hmm. when it comes to the civil rights movement. Please Yet the film is not shy about the, uh, showing some serious that, divisions yeah, 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 in the movement. It really shows that these were people with ideas and they had different ways of doing it. It took an outlier. It took a queer, black, Quaker from Westchester, Pennsylvania to organize the March on Washington. We are going to put together the largest peaceful protest in the history of this nation. Many believe Rustin's work was nearly written out of history because he was openly gay. On the day that I was born black, I was also born homosexual. I think it would be easy to just, you know, talk about his thoughts and ideas and not give you the whole human being. The fact that he was trying to navigate love, romance, sex. Rustin remained committed to the cause. He died in 1987. President Barack Obama, an executive producer of the film, posthumously awarding Rustin the Medal of Freedom in 2013. Domingo says now is the time for Rustin's story to be told. What do you think his legacy is in this country? Bayer Rustin was somebody who devoted his entire life to civil and human rights. These people weren't superheroes. They were just doing what was in front of them. You know, they were ordinary human beings doing things that were extraordinary. What do you say? Zinclair Samoa, NBC News, New York. What an incredible interview. Thanks to Zinclair. Coming up, if you are feeling a little delicate after the Super Bowl and you're planning to call out sick today, you're not alone. Millions of Americans with the Super Bowl flu are expected to stay at home. That's got a lot of people now actually petitioning to make the day after the big game a national holiday. Can they actually score? We'll break it down. That's up next. Welcome back. We have financial headlines for you now. And if you've been thinking about getting a Tesla, the company is offering a sweet deal for a limited time. CNBC's Silvana Hanau joins us with that. Another news. Hey, Silvana. 
Hey, Savannah, good morning. Yes, yeah, so Tesla is temporarily cutting prices on some of its Model Y cars right here in the U.S. until the end of the month. Now, the company reducing the price of the rear wheel drive and the long range versions by $1,000. That's roughly 2%. Now, the move comes as Tesla is warning of, quote, notably lower sales growth this year as it braces for cooling demand and production of its next generation electric vehicle. Elon Musk is denying accusations by Ukraine that Russian forces are using Starlink terminals produced by SpaceX in occupied areas of the country. In a post on X, Musk says those reports are, quote, categorically false. And to the best of the company's knowledge, no Starlinks have been sold directly or indirectly to Russia. In a statement today, the Kremlin says Starlink is not certified for use in Russia, nor are they officially supplied to its forces. And a win by the Chiefs in the Super Bowl may not be good news for investors. Well, that's if you believe the so-called Super Bowl indicator. Now, that says that it, that the market will rise for the year if the winning team was never part of the original American Football League, which is now the AFC, or was in the NFL prior to its merger with the AFL in 1966. But the indicator's track record is actually worse than a coin flip. The markets have historically performed better when the indicator is bearish, up 82% of the time for an average gain of 11%, Savannah. Mm -hmm. All right, there you we'll go. see what happens. Silvana Hanau, thank you very much. Got it. Well, Super Bowl Sunday is, of course, known for watch parties with many people staying up late to tune into the big game. I hosted one. I was up late. Well, if you planned on calling out this morning, you're not alone. According to the UKG Workforce Institute, an estimated 16.1 million American employees plan to miss work today. I like how they're calling it the Super Bowl flu. This comes as there's a renewed push to make Super Bowl Monday a national holiday. NBC News correspondent Emily Aketa has the details. Hey there. Well, I'm clearly not one of the millions of people skipping work today. And while the idea of establishing the day after the Super Bowl as a national holiday isn't exactly a new concept, the push is seeing new momentum, especially after what could be a record number of fans tuning in to last night's game. In a face-off that sent fans to their feet, Super Bowl 58 did not disappoint. The Chiefs defeating the 49ers in an overtime thriller last night. But some say the big game could be even more fun if they had today off. To have the day after Super Bowl as a day off, it makes sense. According to a poll, more than 16 million Americans plan to miss work today. And over 6 million of them say they'll fake being sick or ghost their employer. Many call it the Super Bowl flu. It's one of the few events left where almost everyone in the country does exactly the same thing. And they treat the day after as a day to recover and um, a little bit of an unofficial holiday. And for those clocking in today, it may be a pretty tough morning. Over 28% of workers saying they'll be less productive than usual, prompting some businesses like tech company UKG to cancel Monday morning meetings. It's a way to have a little bit of fun, but also acknowledge what people are going through and give people a couple hours to uh, ease into the week. A fan asked the Kelsey brothers to lead the charge with a different idea, moving the big game from Sunday to Saturday on their podcast. No. Completely It's out. one day out of the year, all right? One, one day. The Super Bowl is meant to be played on Sunday. Yeah. If anything, uh, we need to make Monday a holiday. Yeah. Just make Monday a holiday. Yeah. Don't the, the 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 country should change what they're doing for the Super Bowl, not the Super Bowl for the country. Come on now, people. Come on. Four time Super Bowl champ Rob Gronkowski agrees. Because I think it would be the most celebrated holiday as well. And while some skeptics think that's a step too far. Enjoy the game and all the festivities, but you gotta get it to go to work. Over a third of US workers believe the day after the Super Bowl should be a national holiday. Even ice cream brand Drumstick, which made its Super Bowl commercial debut this year. Where did you all get those? Mm trying to drum up momentum with a change.org petition. Many Americans bleary-eyed this morning, but some lucky students in Kentucky are enjoying a day off after their superintendent made this recent announcement. Whether you're dying to see Taylor, Mahomes, Usher, or just the commercials, this year you can. Paris City Schools is off school the Monday after the Super Bowl. National holiday or not, Sean Scott says he decided to take the day off from his account management job anyway. I've had plenty of Mondays after the Super Bowl where I worked and it was not very productive. Having that day off to relax after, especially after hosting a party, having people over. And so it's important to 
to have Monday off. And keep in mind, Congress has established only a dozen federal holidays, just two in the last 50 years. So a more likely path to an off day is that the NFL continues extending its regular season to push the Super Bowl back a week. And next week is President's Day. Back to you. All right, there you go. Emily, thanks so much. I'm right here with you at work. Coming up, the road to NCAA glory after the break. The basketball phenom who's now just eight points away from making history. We've got more up next. Welcome back. We finally got a look at the stars of the eagerly anticipated Wicked movie during yesterday's Super Bowl. We've got the first little teaser for Wicked Part 1, and it shows Ariana Grande and Cynthia Erivo looking very pink and very green, of course, as Glinda and Alphaba. Fans have waited a long time for this movie. It also stars Michelle Yeoh and Jeff Goldblum. Part 1 is coming to theaters on November 24th this year, with Part 2 released a year later. Would you look at that? Well, a star in women's college basketball is on the verge of making NCAA history. I'm talking about University of Iowa's Caitlin Clark. Now, despite coming up short against Nebraska yesterday, the Hawkeyes star put up 31 points. That leaves her now just eight points shy of breaking the women's Division I all-time scoring record. For more, we are joined by WNBA expert Christina Williams. Christina, thanks for joining us. A major feat we're talking about here. Just tell us about the impact that Clark has had, not only specifically on Iowa's women's basketball program, but women's basketball as a whole. So what makes Caitlin so special is that she's mesmerizing to watch. She plays and exudes confidence on the floor, and she's entertaining with her logo threes and three-point shooting. Caitlin Clark single-handedly put the Iowa program back on the map. She led them to their first Final Four championship game last year. They did fall short to LSU, but she's changing the game in a major way. And we see that happening with the Caitlin Clark effect. She sells out arenas. We saw earlier this season where she packed out over 55,000 fans at the Kinnick Stadium against DePaul University. She's also changing the in-game experience of women's basketball as well. Uh, we see broadcasters now. They have the Caitlin Cam uh, where <laughs> they have TikTok feeds to try to reach younger demographics. And so Caitlin Clark is impacting women's basketball at just the right time as new interest in the game continues to grow and viewership at our record highs. I mean, she's so good. It's not just the scoring that we're talking about. There's another major milestone. She had her 1,000th assist of her college career yesterday. How often do you see this kind of skill in college basketball? Well, Caitlin Clark is just the sixth person to reach such an exclusive club in reaching this assist in women's basketball history. And she joins an elite group of women basketball uh, athletes. But this is just a testament to Caitlin Clark as a player, because not only can she score really well, but also she's a great playmaker and distributor. She makes her teammates better. And I think that this is going to be something that will help her at the next level. She's projected to go number one at the WNBA draft this year. And so I think that joining that elite club and her 1,000th uh, assist mark, it just shows how great and versatile of a player Caitlin Clark is. Yeah, what do you think this means for the WNBA when she gets there? Oh, she's definitely going to change the style of play that we see happening. She plays with a faster pace. I, I, I compare her to a mix of like Stephen Curry with a little bit of Sue Bird and Tisha Panachero. She can score on all three levels, which will be very beneficial to the Indiana Fever, who has that number one pick. I think that she will make an immediate impact on the game. And again, bring those fans over from college into the WNBA. Um, Caitlin Clark is definitely going to be that generational player and talent that changes the game. Oh, absolutely. By the way, what a basket from Steph Curry this weekend with just seconds to go in that game. But that's another story. Christina, we're getting closer <laughs> to March, which means it's almost tournament time. Who are some other women's college basketball players that you're watching out for this season? There are a few players that stand out this season. I think that we see a lot of players emerging, but one player that I'm keeping my eye on, especially is Camilla Cardozo. She's on that number one South Carolina team, and she's a 6'7 center that's expected to go at the top of the draft. Um, a lot of GMs in the WNBA praise her for her great speed and mobility. She can run. She can she can uh, shot block. She has a nice touch around the rim. And she just actually this week, she missed two games due to being with our national team in Brazil. So she's already getting that professional experience. Uh, some other players that I'm taking a look at is Juju Watkins and Hannah Hildigo. 
Juju, she's currently playing at USC, and Hannah is playing for Notre Dame. But these two freshmen are the best we've seen in a while for their respective programs. Juna, Juju and Hannah, they're at the top of the pack. They're two players who are just not, like, living up to the hype mm. uh, as, they, as they came in as freshmen, but they're exceeding the expectations. Uh, Juju, for me, what stands out is just her scoring and her ability to lead. She's averaging over 27 and a half points wow. this season. She's second behind Caitlin Clark and then Hannah mm. Hildigo. She's a great two-way player, two-way guard. So the future of women's basketball is definitely in great hands. And then J.C. Sheldon from Ohio State is someone that also stands out. She can change the game with her defense and She's um, getting a lot of talks of maybe mm -hmm. going at 11 to the New York Liberty in this year's draft. Wow. All right, Christina Williams, thank you so much. Good to see you. Well, finally, this hour, a surgery that is just 10 minutes long is changing lives in South Sudan. NBC News Now anchor Kate Snow has the details on a team of doctors that are giving people new hope and the gift of sight. For eye surgeon Dr. Lloyd Williams, this moment when the bandages first come off says everything. <laughs> After a life-changing eye surgery, this woman is seeing again for the first time in years. That moment, repeated over and over again, as people who had surgery the day before adjust to the light. What is that moment for you? When I first saw it happen, I thought, I could do this for the rest of my life and never feel like I wasted a minute. Dr. Williams, an ophthalmologist at Duke University, has traveled with the Himalayan Cataract Project for a decade on a mission to cure blindness. The latest trip in December to South Sudan in Africa, a country with the highest rate of blindness in the world. Dr. Williams worked alongside two local eye surgeons. For the most part, I don't even get up. I just sit, do surgery, next, do surgery, next. They call these surgical boot camps, performing nearly 2,000 cataract surgeries in just 10 days. People walked from as far away as 40 miles to be here, some arriving in wheelbarrows, many led by a stick. The results are immediate. Five-year-old Kual, confused at first in this new world of sight, before finally spotting his mom. Many families here have a child take care of the person who's blind. You cure the blindness in the individual. You improve the economic situation of the family. You put one of their children back in school. This woman seeing her adult son for the first time in five years. Imagine if you hadn't seen your child for years. Yeah. I mean, it's really yeah. quite remarkable. You don't need to speak the language to understand what's Absolutely. happening. She locks eyes with her son. We had one boy say to us, I don't deserve to have any friends because I'm blind. And when I see that in them and I think I can do something about it, it just makes that all worthwhile. These boot camps changing lives as patients come out of the darkness to see the world in a new light. What a report. Kate Snow, thank you so much. That's going to do it for this hour of Morning News Now. Stay with us. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.